Nearly a year ago, I did a video where I tried to anticipate where we were headed with live and virtual events. I got some things right and I got some things wrong. Find out how I did as a prognosticator one year later. Eleven months ago, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I was invited to give my predictions as to what was going to happen in live events over the year and make recommendations on how to respond at that time. I'm going to evaluate my recommendations, what I did right and what I did wrong, and give you a scorecard of my efforts. Watch through to the end. Hi, I'm Jim Dempsey, and this channel is designed to help leaders of nonprofit organizations increase income and become fully funded. It's my heart to build a community of leaders, staff, and volunteers committed to seeing their nonprofit grow. If this sounds like something that you'd like to be part of, please subscribe to this channel and click the bell to be notified of the next video release on this channel. On March 17, 2020, I joined Jason Galazinski, CEO of Ministry Synced Event Software, for a webinar anticipating the coming pandemic and how nonprofits would deal with the coming uncertainty. All right, well, we are live. It is Tuesday, March 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and we are ready to talk about how to convert your physical event to a virtual event. The central theme of our time was knowing all the restrictions that were coming down the line, that the best plan of attack was don't cancel, change. It has made it impossible for you to physically gather together in groups. And the solution is that we're going to convert our physical event to a virtual event. Jim, I like how you came up with this. Don't cancel, change. Yeah. I Cancel sounds so definitive and really sort of has a negative spin to it. That turned out to be the best advice in the whole video. That canceling was negative and necessary if you could flex and change. So I think the virtual event is a really viable option. I really think you should consider this. As it turned out, some organizations weren't prepared and didn't know what to do and postponed to spring of 2021, which, as we're seeing now, has become very problematic as the pandemic has continued to keep hotels and venues closed, even one year later. Moving forward would have been a wrong decision at, as most governments or organizations restricted any events and even prohibited gatherings of, size, of any size to occur. So it turned out that the best decision came from the advice to convert your physical event to a virtual event. At that time, a lot of terms were thrown around that were even new to me at the time and since have become vocabulary for us. Have a pre-recorded live event. At the time, I knew what a pre-recorded event was and I knew what a live streamed event was, but never imagined a need for a pre-recorded live event. One year later, those events saved many organizations in the spring, summer, and fall of 2020 and are actually still of value in 2021. Now, the first lesson we learned was that online fatigue can occur. What worked so well in 2020 is slowly getting less useful with each season. The term Zoom was so new at that time. That was not even used in the original video. Jason Galazinski used Skype and the recommendation of live stream platform was YouTube. That's still recommended, but we've added Facebook and other social media platforms in hopes of getting a larger audience. But frankly, what was so new and unique in 2020 has become commonplace and even passe for most. I can't tell you how often I'm hearing, oh Jim, I don't wanna be on one more Zoom call or one more YouTube. People are Zoomed and YouTubed out. We've got to look for other ways to get people to join your live stream broadcast. Tell part two of the story that you told last year or add a live chat or a live Q&A at the tail end of your video and announce a new initiative or something special that only those watching the live portion would benefit from. During the webinar, we talked about five steps to running a smooth virtual event. They include Step number one, email your guests immediately and let them know that you're not canceling, you're changing. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the second thing we are gonna recommend is that you pre-record your live event as a video. Number three, live stream your pre-recorded video on YouTube the night of your event. Uh, while you are live streaming, you'll have the opportunity to engage people on YouTube chat. The fifth thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you wanna give people the opportunity to give online. All those work very well. Lesson two, find a good way to give. We got four out of five of the steps correct and probably got step five right. We did encourage people to give online through a link in the description of the video on the screen. However, we learned early on that websites for most organizations were not prepared and were not equipped to handle commitments, pledges, or other unusual giving options. As a result, we had to create a Google form that was the link and not the organization's website as the link. We found that having our viewers complete the form, which included indicating how much they'd like to commit over the year, monthly, annually, turned out to be the best bet. Then, once someone submitted the Google form, they immediately were sent to a link to give a gift immediately on the website. That was and still is the best option. We then moved on to answer the question, how long should the live stream event be? It's really important that this, uh, that we be very, very sensitive to how long this is. People's attention span these days are very short. And proceeded to recommend an 18 minute option. We use the words, think TED Talk. Uh, I think about the TED Talk model. That's about 18 minutes. 45 minutes was the second option. Option number two would be a 45 minute program. And I want you to think more like Bible study groups. Well, the lesson we learned was shorter is better. Well, as it turned out, we were half right. And hands down, the shorter option was the better option. After 30 minutes, we saw a dramatic drop off in views and of course in giving. The sweet spot seemed to be around 18 to 24 minutes. We lost 25% of viewers every, every 15 minutes after the 30 minute time spot. Some events risked the 45 minute option and even went to the 60 minute option, which one event I saw a 75% drop in viewership using the 60 minute option. At the time, we didn't introduce the four minute max principle, which I learned only weeks later after the broadcast. No message should go more than four minutes without changing locations or changing speakers. Viewer fatigue sets in on the viewer's attention and it's lost after that four minutes. That rule proved to be true and it still is true now. Then in the original video, we went on to recommend watch parties. Those are five to 10 couples invited to a home, preferably uh, as, as a table, to be brought to watch the broadcast live. And what this would do is, this would allow table hosts to invite people to their home for either dessert or for a meal, and to be able to watch this event together as a group. Mm -hmm. In the spring and summer of 2020, we never got to evaluate the watch party idea as so very few government regulations allowed gatherings of five to 10 people. And when restrictions loosened, many people didn't feel comfortable to gather. That leads us to lesson four. The jury is still out on watch parties. As we moved to the fall of 2020 and restrictions loosened, some dinners were able to employ the watch party process and increase viewership. But we learned that a commitment to be a watch party host turned out to be a larger commitment than even being a table host. When asked to be a table host for a live event, the biggest effort was the time spent on the phone asking someone to sit at your table. But once the night and the event arrived, you were treated as a king and a queen participating in a fine a complimentary meal and nice conversation and program. The commitment to being a watch party host included inviting guests, cleaning your house, preparing hors d'oeuvres, snacks, beverages, and possibly light or a heavy meal. And then a program afterwards, making sure there was discussion before and after the video. These were no small requirements and we had about half as many commitments to being watch party hosts for virtual events as we did table hosts for live events. The next area in the video was that of follow-up. Three recommendations were made in the original video. We recommend that you visit individuals who have given significant gifts, a 
call to the people minimum that are $600 or more because you're going to have some people who don't make a decision to give that night. And I think it's important for you to follow up, especially people who have given to your organization in the past at dinners. I think it'd be really important to follow up and just make sure, especially individuals who've made large gifts in the past, a follow-up phone call to those people just to find out, uh, have you been, if you had an opportunity to pray about the options we mentioned on Saturday night. That leads to lesson five. Also contact those unable to watch the live stream or those who failed to give. We mentioned in the video the importance of follow-up thank you calls, visits, and letters, but we failed to emphasize and where we saw the biggest fall off was a failure to contact those current and large donors who failed to watch the broadcast or those who did not watch but did not respond in any way to participate. There were major missteps in contacting people the next days. Teams did not anticipate the number of key donors who did not watch or watched but did not give or commit. Those teams prepared for easy thank you calls but were unprepared for challenges and sometimes difficult conversations with those needing a lot more information. After a few missteps though, teams started getting better but after significant preparation. The last area mentioned in the video was how to track attendance or a live broadcast. So one of the questions that we might have in a live stream is how do we know who attended or not? So anything we can do to try to get people to uh, let us know that they were there, that would be really helpful. Suggestions given were Google Form, Typeform, and SurveyMonkey. Also mentioned were raffles, drawings, or gifts to get people to indicate whether they were on the broadcast or not. Before I share the sixth and final lesson I've learned from these lessons, if you liked what you heard, hit the like button and consider sharing this with a colleague or friend. And please subscribe to the channel and join our community of nonprofit leaders trying to take our fundraising efforts to the next level. Lesson six, find a better way to track attendance on YouTube. We learned very early that views only gave part of the picture. We really couldn't put a name to a view and thus follow-up letters and e-blasts had to be very generic. If you watched, thank you. If you weren't able to watch, there's the link. Please do so soon. Fortunately, Ministry Sync designed a free add-on product called Virtual Check-In, which allowed the viewer to go through their portal and essentially capturing all their information where they were eventually dropped off to the YouTube link seamlessly, never noticed. Well, it's time for the wrap up on my prognostication skills and recommendations. Remarkably, I got a 5.5 out of 6, and that translates to an A-. minus. The biggest takeaway, which seemed to sum up the entire video was, don't cancel, change. And that was the gold nugget suggestion that made the entire video worth watching. I hope you can go back and evaluate my recommendations for yourself, and I hope you have as much fun as I did. As I said earlier, the objective of this channel is to help you greatly increase your income for your nonprofit organization. If you found this video helpful, let me know by giving it a thumbs up. And if you wish to watch future videos on this channel, hit the subscribe button and click the bell to be notified immediately of the next release. Also, Post a comment below if there were things that you especially liked and if there were topics you'd like me to address. For videos similar to this, click on the video in the playlist listed above. To watch other videos related to nonprofit fundraising, go to Development Effectiveness Strategies. Also, if you have fundraising questions, then our weekly broadcast Jim and Java program is for you. Submit your questions on Twitter at DevFStrats and use the hashtag Jim and Java. And as always, I wish you the best as you strive to increase your income and reach the goal of becoming fully funded. Thank you.